This is a bioprinter. Its primary purpose is to create transplant-ready organs suited for a specific person, instead of trying to make a person suit someone else's organ. There are hundreds of thousands of people, if not millions, waiting right now for life-saving organ transplants. There is a far greater need for organs than there is supply, so sadly, many people will never receive the organ they need. Those that do receive an organ could still lose it. Organs are, in many cases, rejected by the patient's body. This happens when the body recognizes the organ as a foreign object and mounts an immune response to fight it off. Many organ recipients minimize the risk of rejection with immune suppressants, but doing so leaves them vulnerable to disease. Wouldn't it be great if, instead of this process, we could just grow our own perfectly tailored body parts? Well, for the first time ever, there's the potential for this. Bioprinting is a branch of restorative medicine that is used to print living tissues. Tissues are a group of similar cells in the body that work together to do something. Organs are made up of several tissues. With the brutal organ and tissue shortage that is currently ongoing, bioprinting could provide transplants and alleviate the pressure on the donor waiting list. One of the most important things here is that bioprinting can print tissues with the patient's own cells, which makes them far less likely to be rejected. But what else could we do with this technology? Well, if you don't already know, animal testing for medical treatment is commonplace. This, of course, has its own ethical concerns, but another issue is that a massive number of drugs that show promise in animal trials end up failing in human trials. It's one of the best testing methods we have, but it's imprecise, wasteful, and ethically gray. What if we could grow our own human tissues to test on without putting any living beings at risk? What if we could test a specific medication on your own tissue that was grown in a lab to see how it reacts. All of this is cool, but how do these machines actually work? Instead of using filament, resin, or another material like many other kinds of 3D printers, bioprinters print with something called bioink. Put simply, it's a concoction of cells, gels, and nutrients. Bioinks can contain multiple cell types, and you can combine multiple bioinks in one print. What matters most here is the gel. Hydrogel, which is basically water jello, is what suspends the cells in place. It mimics the cell's natural environment and helps keep them alive. This gel can also contain chemicals to keep the cells naturally growing, instead of frozen in stasis. Following the print, the gel needs to solidify. Sometimes it does this on its own, and sometimes a chemical or physical process is used to do so. This solidification is called cross-linking, as polymer strands are linked together during this process. Most bioprinters use STL files, which represents 3D structures as triangular tessellations. STL literally stands for Standard Tessellation Language. This format has been around for decades and is a standard export format used by most 3D printing softwares. For this reason, you can design files for bioprinting in almost any CAD software. There are three main types of bioprinting, extrusion, optical, and spheroid. They go by a lot of different names, but the categories remain the same. Extrusion printing is similar to your standard filament printing, also known as FDM or FFF, and it's the most accessible type of printing out there. Bioink is deposited through a nozzle in layers to form a 3D shape. Now, while this process is fast and comparably affordable, it's not the most precise. It's also worth noting that the pressure from the printer's nozzle can sometimes destroy the very tissue it's creating. Optical bioprinting, on the other hand, relies on light, usually lasers, to form a shape in a vat of bioresin. This is comparable to stereolithography, or SLA printers. The bioresin it prints with is essentially a mix of cells, hydrogen, and different chemicals. When light emitted from the printer hits an area of the resin, it solidifies to form a three-dimensional shape. The resolution of these parts, or how detailed the shape can be, is significantly better than what you can get with extrusion printing. This is primarily due to the fidelity of a micron-thin laser beam versus a thicker nozzle. On top of that, most bioresins have been chemically designed to give cells a really good chance at surviving the printing process and beyond. Now, spheroid printing is the unique one. Cells often self-organize into clusters called spheroids, which is obviously not represented well with an even distribution of cells in a hydrogel. Spheroids form a type of simple, self-organized tissue that has its own rudimentary level of structure and function. It doesn't rival the structural complexity of native organs, though. Spheroid printers organize cell spheroids into 3D structures where they can then attach to one another, creating a more complex tissue. 
Each printing modality has its benefits and drawbacks, and the situation dictates which is used. Sometimes multiple formats are used in combination to maximize the benefits of each one. In a hypothetical organ transplant situation, it would be important to get it printed fast, which is extrusion specialty, but also precisely, which is optical's domain. Using a combination of both could maximize speed and precision. Growing a major organ is quite difficult, and figuring out how to do it well is a very active area of research. One of the biggest challenges are actually blood vessels. In people, oxygen is transported to organs through a complicated web of blood vessels and capillaries. Somehow, the print needs to make room for these vessels to regenerate in the right places, which is a whole conversation in itself involving asparagus, but we can talk about that another time. Regardless, it's complicated. There's a ton of amazing research happening in this field right now, but we're not yet at a point where Purilator can send you a custom to you ready for transplant organ. For that reason alone, it is important to join the organ donation list if you're not already on it. You can save up to six lives by donating your organs at the end of your life. You won't know they're gone, but they could be the most precious thing in the world to someone in need. Until next time.